Welcome to Deep Pockets by Petra Söderling. A conversation about governments, technologies and innovation. You are now listening to season 3 of Winter 2024. I call this season The Book Club. In March 2023, I published my own book, Governments and Innovation, The Economic Developer's Guide to Our Future, which is available in Amazon in paperback, hardcover, and as a Kindle ebook. It's now time to look at some other great books out there that discuss the same theme, how publicly funded technologies turn into privately run innovation, and what happens after that. Our theme song is by New Orleans jazz icon, Leroy Jones. Deep Pockets works in cooperation with Studio Aguse, a boutique recording studio in south of France for audiobooks, podcasts and music. In my book, Government and Innovation, The Economic Developer's Guide to Our Future, I list a number of ways governments enable the birth and expansion of new innovation. The list includes things such as laws, regulations, taxes, trade agreements, infrastructure, education, immigration funding, and so on. It's often ignored that local, regional, and national governments are often the first paying customer for emerging technologies. Think of nuclear energy, vaccines, the internet, quantum technologies. The first push to take these research projects into commercial use came from the government. So how do you, as an entrepreneur or a business leader, get a government contract? Dan Roche has done just about everything when it comes to government contracting. He's been an executive leader, program manager, business development specialist, proposal writer, technical writer, computer programmer, visual designer, and user experience engineer. He's even been a classroom instructor, helping Marines in active war zones make better use of technology to stay safe and accomplish mission objectives. One day, Dan heard someone say they wished they better understood government contracting but didn't have the time or patience to learn. Dan took it as a challenge. His response, a book with the title, The Total Beginner's Handbook for Doing Business with the Government, a plain language, easy to understand, and mildly entertaining guide to a complicated and often misunderstood business. Welcome to Deep Pockets, Dan. Petra, thank you very much for having me. So, First of all, I just love the title. And let me repeat it one more time for the folks in the back. The Total Beginner's Handbook for Doing Business with the Government. A plain a language. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Easy to understand and mildly entertaining guide to a complicated and often mi- misunderstood business. And I can attest to the entertaining because it, it was very entertaining. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thank you. <laughs> so tell us in more detail how this book came into existence and what has the reception been like? And by the way, I hope my short intro did your career justice there. It was fantastic. You almost yeah. gave me too much credit, but thank you so much for that. And um, in terms of where the book came from, I'm going to go back, not too far back, but I've had a lot of great mentors in my life. I'm very lucky for that. Um, But one of the best pieces of advice I got, which I will happily tell anyone who listens, is if you want to learn a subject, there is kind of a cheat code in everyone's brain, which I believe in, and it's make yourself teach it to somebody else. So say, take anything you want to learn about, be it cooking, exercise, finance, et cetera. And when people give themselves the goal of teaching it at some level to one of their friends, to a classmate, to a colleague in say seven days, something a bit ambitious. In my experience, that kind of unlocks a certain learning habit in one's brain. Perhaps it takes down some of the obstacles and people are better able to ingest information. So ever since college, One of my internal habits has been whenever I want to learn something, 
I go about teaching it and building up the building blocks of what it takes and what it involves step by step by step. And this has kind of become second nature, honestly. Um, and it's something that I swear by. But one of the other things that you learn being a teacher and that I've learned that I'm sure others have as well is the essence of communicating a subject, which can be complicated and intimidating, is often to find a way to effectively simplify it and break it down to, to its core parts to make something digestible, understandable, X, Y, Z. So those two habits that I've basically just described to me have kind of in some ways been my, my career style as I go along. Now, how this led up to the book was, again, as you mentioned before, I've had the luck to do a lot of various things in this business. I believe very much in the importance and the ideal of government contracting because for a lot of very, very important things uh, are the responsibility of the public sector. Uh, the, the realm of government spending uh, is in charge of supporting better health outcomes for people internationally, from managing things like the use of sovereign debt to help ameliorate uh, global causes and to uh, really uh, achieve global objectives. And also a lot of things that necessarily might not be accomplished uh, by commercial industry become the domain of public services. So to me, it's very important that the best people are able to, to, to do, do their best work uh, when it's the taxpayer footing the bill, when it's for public service, where it's for the public good. And this book, in some ways, was in some, an, an overdue culmination of all the things I just mentioned. It was my effort to, furthermore, break down my own understanding of the industry in terms of uh, teaching it to others, uh, simplifying concepts that are often scary uh, or overcomplicated in the mind's eye, breaking them down to a more common lexicon. And also, moreover, the mission was, I believe that there are better outcomes for the general public when our best and brightest are in the game of government contracting, working to do better services, to provide better value to the taxpayer, and otherwise raising the bar of excellence in that industry. So this book is kind of the culmination of those things come together. And I think that it was, in some ways, a book that I thought was missing from the public library. There are books you can get on government contracts. There's books you can get on things like the FAR, various regulations. But there was missing, in my mind, a real 101 that would address, frankly, anyone with questions, with curiosity, with a will to get involved or consider being involved. And that's what I hope this book is able to fill. I love it. If the audience would see me, they would just see me smile and nod like, for everything that you say. I just, I'm in Thank you. violent agreement with everything you, you just said. Well, it, except for one thing, you said government spending. <laughs> I have a mission to uh, change the language into government investment. But that's, you know, yeah. I, I, that's a better use of words. I will take that down and feedback taken, Petra. 100% okay. right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, right now, uh, it's the end of 2023, and the book is currently number 51 in government management um, category in Amazon. And it's mm -hmm. even been in the top 10 earlier uh, at some yes. point, which is amazing. So congratulations one more time, not just for writing the book, but having it top 10 Amazon. That's, that's really uh, rare. Um, so this is your only book that I know of uh, on Amazon. And uh, you're, are you doing anything else around this topic other than the book? So what are you doing with the newly found fame being talked oh, about? Oh, well, the fame author? and the and the amazing author money. No, it's it's yeah. it's well, first off, um, the book's success to say it wasn't expected is an understatement. Um, I put the book out roughly a year ago. And honestly, there was a moment in time where I thought my next step would be to consult on the book to teach it and kind of make it my full-time gig. I realized very quickly that I missed working with teams in the actual game. Mm -hmm. So I'm currently supporting a company called ICF, working to support um, health science uh, and health technology for the public good. But what I will say about the book is that 
tracing its success over the last year, in addition to me being floored and humbled and grateful and overwhelmed by everything, it's been amazing to see how it's caught on. With any book, when it first came out, of course, there was some interest. People I knew where I had worked bought several copies. But what I've been tracking, and this is made possible by technology, is every day in many major cities, I sell a few copies, which is wonderful. If I sell a single copy, I'm overjoyed. But what I have seen is that every so often, someone might purchase 30 at a time. 40 at a time. This tells me that people are reading it and then buying it for their teams, for their colleagues. Mm -hmm. And whenever I see that, um, again, it's absolutely humbling. There is no higher recommendation you can get than someone passing it around. And what something began also began to happen about six months ago is I noticed that some schools and even libraries were making purchases and my first impulse was, of course, again, uh, gratefulness, wow. uh, whatever yeah. the word is there. But moreover, I will say to anyone listening is if any school or institution would like my book, uh, get a hold of me on my website, danroach.com, and I will happily give you as many copies as you can handle. The fact that this is going to be in a library somewhere, um, I could ask for no higher validation. So uh, the fact that people are reading it, uh, is a service to me. And again, the fact that it's still selling and turning heads a year later on, this wasn't part of the script and I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, in terms of next steps, I think inevitably uh, there will be updates. There are topics in my head. The one thing I will say to anybody else, anybody listening, is each of us has at least 10 books in us. Uh, the experience of writing a book, I'd recommend to anybody uh, writing can be very freeing and liberating. Editing can be miserable, but it's all part of the process. Mm -hmm. And there definitely will be follow-ups. I have a few ideas. I'm not sure where I go next, but this is not my last uh, publication. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, the, the Total Beginner's Handbook for Doing Business with the Government is targeted to businesses who are looking to get government contracts. But the audience here, most of the people here in Deep Pockets, is people from the government, the federal, national, state, city, local, mostly U.S., but some Europeans as well. And many of these people work in economic development or foreign direct investment. Do you have a message to the government side? If, if you had a magic wand or let's say you were the president of the United States for a day, what would you do in order to make government more accessible to businesses? Or, or do you even think there's a need for that? That is a great question. Uh, breaking it down a bit, the first thing I will say to anyone in the government is I understand. Uh, I understand why... One can simply snap their fingers and make government investment, thank you, Petra, a much more fluid and efficient marketplace. Um, in my career, I've been around various industries whose business is the investment and use of funds. And one of the questions that always comes into play is, whose money is this? Now, uh, in commercial lending and commercial debt, there is a natural sorting function on things like risk and risk tolerance and how much and what the actual stakes are of providing a return on investment. And I'll get into why this is important shortly. But same thing for sovereign debt. The question is very much who is paying and and are they going to have an opinion upon what's happening with the money in the case? And the, the answer is usually yes. With government investment, the, the customer is ultimately the taxpayer, and the funding is allotted by acts of Congress who were elected. So there will always be a sense of accountability for those funds that in some ways will tend towards more of a risk-averse posture in terms of how the money is spent. This is not good or bad. It's just what it is. And that's something which you can't undo. Uh, I would love it if the government began going to Vegas and putting it on red, but that's not going to happen. Uh, the one normal thing I will say about innovation is innovation at some level has to do with the acceptance of 
risk. It's taking risks, taking shots, and risk inherently means that many things will fail. If you want to score a lot of goals, you take a lot of shots on goal. That means your success rate may drop, but the goals will increase. We've heard about Apple Computer, but for every Apple, there are 10,000 garage companies that failed or ended horribly. And you can argue about how to create more apples, or you can just increase the number of failures and see what kind of uh, success rate that tapestry provides. Now, how this gets to the government, it's a bit trickier because I cannot tell the government to take more risks. What I can encourage, and this is already happening, and I want to talk about that in a second as well, is there are steps afoot to simplify the acquisition process. A lot of the barriers to entry within government contracting make it very difficult for companies below a certain threshold of investment to get involved and throw their hats in the ring. There are ways that people can be eligible to work for the government, but in terms of being competitive and having their voices heard, there are often barriers in terms of investment, in terms of legal exposure, in terms of accountability, which can make that initial foray into working for the government a bit difficult and can require a bit more investment and, frankly, more risk. At the same time, I want to give credit there is there are people in the government right now who are taking some very aggressive steps towards increasing that innovation foothold in government investment. And one way is to, frankly, increase the number of smaller procurement actions. I mentioned before the idea of risk, and the more money one tends to bet, the lower their risk tolerance tends to go. And the one thing you mentioned before, Pedro, in an earlier podcast is a lot of the government investments that are very big ticket, that are large exposure, that are very high visibility, the risk tolerance is understandably very low. One thing you're seeing a lot within S&T and various agencies are smaller procurement, smaller task orders to try things out, to dip the proverbial toe in the pool. But moreover, with smaller task orders, you can afford to take more shots on goal. If I'm betting $10, I might get a bit more aggressive than if I'm betting my home equity. And when you're able to break down the acquisitions into smaller chunks, agencies can afford to be a bit more experimental. And I hope that's one thing which they advance. But I also want to give shout outs to, there are groups within the government that are making a very intelligent and very actionable effort to encourage and lower the barriers for small businesses to get involved. And one of them is the uh, ESPIR engagement, SBIR.gov, Small Business Innovation Research and Tech Transfer Programs. And they are taking legitimate meaningful steps to lower the barriers and to encourage small businesses, even that are garage level, to get involved and be part of the government mix. Now, will they single-handedly address the inherent uh, risk-reward uh, ratio that has to do with uh, spending taxpayer money? No, but that's a long-term goal. I think the meaningful action happening underway, and I'm very happy with it, are smaller steps to lower the barriers to adoption and encourage more smaller investments to try things out and take a few more risks, calculated risks, with the taxpayer dime. Yeah, uh, you you almost already uh, answered my next question, but let's let's expand. Oh, I'm at, a sorry bit. about that. No, not at all. <laughs> this is so interesting, hugely. I'm hugely screwing interesting. up. Oh. No, <laughs> it, it's a conversation. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk more about the deep technologies, but as you, yes. you, you spoke about innovation, it's basically the same thing. Um, but, you know, uh, we'll talk about AI, a lot of people talk about quantum, blockchain, people wondering what is that, and these are all uh, government uh, technologies that are sponsored and used by the government. Um, and they use them to protect national security. And they, but these are also technologies that private companies develop for commercial use. We talk about so-called dual-use technologies. So can you expand on your view on this? Should there be more or less government contracting on these dual-use technologies? Because 
on one hand, why would you want taxpayer money to develop something that a private company can do? But then on the other hand, Uh, how do you ensure that the private companies that we let into the national security processes are friendly companies with good intentions? They could be anybody, right? So you write in the in the book, and I'm going to quote, an agency em- empowered to innovate or try new things may feel less burdened by political pressure and more willing to take a chance on a new partner or a less recognized name, end of quote. So what would this look like in practice? Can you expand on what you just explained earlier? Uh, Very good question. The first part of the question, and this is, I'm sure, what you uh, understand, but I want listeners just to understand there as well, is I think in terms of government investment in technology, I think the government's future and the public's future will always be in large part making use of technology that is in the commercial sector as well. Um, I think that for all things, some of the leading technologies and say data or uh, analysis or even AI, et cetera, that will be things that will be in large part products of commercial enterprise. I think I want to set the impression that the government need not build everything from scratch, nor should they. That would be very inefficient, and I think it would also run into a lot of uh, obstacles by the dynamic I mentioned in the earlier question. I do think that being able to get comfortable and institutionalize commercial solutions be necessary. There's no other option but to do that. But at the same time, to your point, security is a massive concern and always will be. I don't See, and this is, I think, one of the nat- natures of all technology, wherever you go, is the risk, and this is, I hate to say this, the risk will never be zero. When we're innovating and taking these steps and moving towards that global village, the technology, the risks imposed by technology will never be zero. We can minimize them, but it's about controlling them as opposed to clamping down. Uh, I do think there is a balance, and I think that a lot of agencies right now are addressing this risk balance through things like sandboxing, through more intelligent means to basically experiment with or pilot technologies. And of course, a bit bit of the arms race happening right now is information security, being able to keep up with the newest threats that may in fact Uh, come in through the use of commercial services or cloud services that might disrupt some of the old constructs of what security means. I'm seeing places throughout HHS and DOD and DHS embrace the idea of these proving grounds to both create familiarity with technology that comes from the outside, but to also involve industry in helping fireproof these things to lower the risk of any kind of uh, external threat. The one thing that I am seeing, and this has been an evolution of the past 10 10 or so, 15, 20 years, is oftentimes I would say that the idea of what insecurity is often evolves over time and it can be very counterintuitive. What I mean by that is in the 2000s, when cloud first became an idea, a concept when it was first sold, a lot of agencies and frankly companies, it wasn't just public and private, would still overinvest in data centers, in servers, in their own private physical enclaves. Because in large part, the idea of having something close to you simply felt more secure. Cloud, by its nature, felt very insecure, but when you actually break it down, that's an emotional feeling. There is no inherent security you have over your machinery if I can reach out and touch it. If I have a laptop right here, the one that I'm talking with you on, is not necessarily any more secure than one I would have in a virtual data center somewhere in California. So in some ways, it wasn't simply a matter of addressing security. It was trying to keep up on those things that would constitute real threats to security. And again, this is now a cliche, but the biggest thing was was personnel. 
uh, weak links in the chain, ways you can expose information that let other actors in. So a lot of what I've seen evolve, and this has been a positive a positive thing, are movements towards towards authorization steps, towards ways which help clamp down, say, careless human actions that might require or that might introduce security issues, and to intelligently look at the real threats that might come in from the outside in ways that might challenge some of the old uh, rules of thumb of what security means. So to answer, that was a long way to answer your question. I'm sorry, I'm kind of off on a tangent here. But to answer your first question, the government must embrace commercial technologies. There's no other way. The alternative would put them back 10, 15 years and forget about it. Um, the one thing I would say in terms of embracing them is it's inevitable. It has to happen. Uh, the idea of Sandboxing, of course, there is also notions of, say, requirements that have been put into place regarding FISMA requirements that have done a very good job of creating a certain, a certain standard lexicon of what uh, must be done to bring technology towards a certain required level of security and transparency. That's advancing the whole FISMA initiative and other requirements therein. But I would say that uh, keeping up is the only option. The one caution I would give is don't fall into perhaps older, more obsolete definitions of what secure means, because in that path, I've seen agencies, frankly, waste money. Uh, cloud is inevitable. Uh, 5G is inevitable. These things must be addressed and simply refusing to move to the cloud or running Ethernet cables off the ground floor, that's going to reach the point of insanity before too long. So. Yeah. Wow, those are really, really great points. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. You talked about uh, small and minority owned businesses in your book as well. Yes. Um, so if you look at the main suppliers of defense technologies, they tend to be huge companies. You've got your Lockheeds and so forth. So how could we get more small businesses and maybe a little bit more diversity, more DEI involved in these riskier deep tech cases? Well, the good thing about that, and this is a very positive thing, is there's a lot of things in the government that make it easier and lower barriers of entry to small businesses or those who represent more DEI concerns. I have a chapter in the book to where there are a lot of things within acquisition law which say uh, create a very a much easier pathway for, say, companies that I'm an, that, are, that I'm an already owned that operate in more historically underutilized districts uh, who have, say, for example, ownership who are from certain representative uh, classes and, um, and demographics. That is a very, very good thing. I would say right now my main focus on that would be more supply side. And part of what my book addresses is helping these would-be entrepreneurs understand what's there. And I would encourage them to make use of those programs. And Can more be done? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and read oh, yes. your book, obviously. And read my, exactly. Read my book on Amazon, wherever any good books are sold, but also uh, to make use of those programs there. Uh, can more be done from the government to encourage this? Of course, always. But I would say a lot of what's there is currently in place. I would encourage would be uh, contractors to make themselves aware, to make use, and to go get them. Okay, uh, to maybe uh, expand on the same kind of thoughts this is my final question. It's about the future. I ask the same question of all of my guests here. Um, so regarding young people, what kind of advice or suggestion would you give to young people looking for a career in either public government or the private business side? Well, I already gave away my cheat codes for your first question of learn to teach and learn to simplify. But the one thing I would say to anybody, and this is in any endeavor, any industry, whatever you want to do, is uh, don't get intimidated. It is very easy to whatever field you're in to get confused, overwhelmed, intimidated, and to give up and go home. And I will say, having not conquered, but having in some ways deconstructed government technology and government acquisition, nothing is as complicated as it seems from the outside. No matter what you want to get into, there are people out there who are 
not as smart as you and won't work, work as hard as you who have managed to figure it out. I would say don't let yourself be discouraged by things that seem too heady, too complex, too jargony. Work to educate yourself, challenge yourself, break those things down. And I promise you, whatever you want to do, whether it's medicine or technology or consulting or pick any field, finance, it goes on and on and on. Keep digging, keep learning. And I promise you, you'll begin to see things in a simpler light over time. But the one thing about this book, and I put this even on the forward, is I've seen people simply give up and say, too complicated, I'll never do it. Mm -hmm. And I cringe because honestly, not to give up the whatever novelty my business has, it ain't that complicated. And it's important and it's worthy of understanding. And once you do, there is great work to be done and that needs to be done in service of all of us. This has been an engaging conversation with Dan Roche, author of The Total Beginner's Handbook for Doing Business with the Government, a plain language, easy to understand, and mildly entertaining guide to a complicated and often misunderstood business. Available in Amazon on paperback and Kindle ebook. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much, Petra. You've listened to Deep Pockets by Petra Söderling. To subscribe for more content like this, go to petrasoderling.com. The wonderful music you heard is by Leroy Jones, an iconic New Orleans Jazz Hall of Fame trumpetist. You can find this and other Leroy Jones tunes at your favorite online or offline music store. Deep Pockets works in cooperation with Maison de la Guse, a quaint bed and breakfast and Studio Aguse, a boutique recording studio in south of France for audiobooks, podcasts, and music. Stay in the beautiful bed and breakfast Maison while recording your work, assisted by top hospitality and audio technology professionals. Find on Instagram as Studio Aguse, that's A-G-U-Z-E. Thanks for listening, and be sure to subscribe, like, rate, and share our episodes. It means a lot to me and to my guests. We appreciate your support. Thank you.